reject the ideology of globalism and we embrace the doctrine of patriotism. Not only will this tax plan pay for itself, but it will pay down debt. There are moral and legal obligation questions that I think we'll have to wrestle with as a society. When we as people go wobbly on the truth, we go wobbly on America. All you have to do is look at the numbers, look at what we've done. And this is only the beginning. From 100.9 FM WXIR, this is Evidence of Design, and I'm your host, Jason Taylor. Evidence of Design is a live talk show about the political economy. We critique income and wealth inequality and support democratic values. Thank you for listening, and welcome. Good morning, morning, everyone. everyone. You're listening to Evidence of Design on 100.9 FM WXIR in Rochester. It's Saturday, July 3rd, 2021. This is a live show. I'm your host, Jason Taylor, joined in WXIR's studios by my good friends and co-hosts, Matt Treadwell. Yo. And Mary Lawrence. Hey. For those of you new to Evidence of Design, we critique income and wealth inequality we think there's way too much economic inequality in society but we also believe there's something we can do about it it's not an accident why there's so much economic inequality we believe that we as humans create our social and economic conditions they are not random or haphazard and therefore hey we have the power to make our lives better through government action and social cohesion so in this show we investigate where economic inequality comes from and we propose what we can do about it on today's episode in particular we are going to be talking about battle royale folks i'm so excited have you heard about battle royale i'm not just talking about the 2000 film that we'll get into but also the cultural genre of battle royale movies books video games battle royale is kind of here to stay in the 2010s at least in this end of the past decade and and still today what's going on with battle royale what does it have what is it what does it have to say about our culture and society such that there is so much well cultural touchstones that deal with the battle royale genre just like zombies were huge in the 2000s battle royale has been huge in the 2010s what's going on with that we're doing a cultural analysis today on evidence of design we'd love to hear from you have you seen the 2000 film battle royale have you read or seen the hunger games have you played video games like fortnite well all of those are battle royale themed what do you think about battle royale what questions do you have about it what do you think battle royale has to say about our society you can let us know 585-219-8889 that's 585-219-8889 i was going to say you can also give us a call folks that's a phone number give us a call at that number 585-219-8889 you can also probably find us on facebook at radio eod mary are we setting up that live stream with any luck yet uh, we'll be live in just a moment here. Wonderful. So you can also stay in touch with us throughout the show on our Facebook page at Radio EOD. We're going to jump into talking about Battle Royale right after a short break here on Evidence of Design. Hang on. Mortal Combat by the Immortals. <laughs> and this is Evidence of Design on 100.9 FM, WXIR in Rochester. Whenever I hear that song, I'm like, I forgot that's a thing. <laughs> it's Whenever a I hear that song, I just want to, I just lose my mind and want to bang my head against the wall. Engage in Mortal Kombat, yeah. perhaps. <laughs> there is a, a new Mortal Kombat film that was just released, I think, this year, folks. So I don't know if anyone's gotten to see that, but I don't know if that song is in it, but I surely hope it is, because if it's not, super, super disappointing. Why are you playing a song about Mortal Kombat? Well, on today's show, we're talking about battle royale it is a cultural genre as one could say nowadays let's talk about what it what is it and what does it mean and have to say about our society all three of us matt mary and i watched 
a 2000 film called Battle Royale Last Night. It's directed by Kinji Kukasaku. I am doing great at that. That's close. So uh, Kinji Kukasaku, director, uh, came out in Japan in 2000. And the film, Matt, you can jump in at any time, but the film depicts around 42 ninth graders who are forced to fight to the death by the Japanese government on a deserted island. And the only way someone gets out alive is by being the last one alive. So they have three days to fight to the death. Otherwise, they will all explode. Yeah, so if any of this is sounding familiar, it was... I don't know that... Um, I can't remember the author's name who wrote The Hunger Games, but I don't know if... She, Suzanne Collins. I don't know if she's ever formally acknowledged the sort of inspiration that Battle Royale surely served for The Hunger Games, but it's very much to the same premise. <clears throat> um the the sort of backdrop to the the movie at least is that um at the turn of the century meaning the turn of the new millennium uh the japanese government sort of suffered a major economic collapse um unemployment skyrocketed uh and and sort of juvenile and delinquent crime rates rose exponentially and sort of the 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 government fearing and and i guess the also the general adult populace fearing this new emerging criminal youth culture passed what was called the Battle Royale Act, <laughs> which basically says that every year a a, a class of middle schoolers, or, or I guess ninth graders, which would technically, technically be high schoolers for us, is selected um, randomly, supposedly, to compete in a, uh, a deathmatch-style game in which only one... Uh, in which the game does not end until only one person is left standing. And that, of course, as you mentioned, sounds pretty similar to The Hunger Games. Major cultural milestone in the mid-2010s. And now in video games, I'm sure you've heard of someone or heard yourself uh, of the game called Fortnite. Well, there's plenty of video games out there, too. Player Unknowns, Battlegrounds, H1Z1, Apex Legends, and Call of Duty Warzone, and perhaps Fortnite, most famously, that are Battle Royale-style games. So there's so many movies and books and video games out there using this Battle Royale-style genre of last person standing. This 2000 film called Battle Royale released in Japan was sort of the modern incarnation of it. Of course, you know, who can truly claim credit to starting a thought or idea? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's influences before it, but uh, at least for the modern conception, we'll say, you know, the, the, the 2000 film Battle Royale, from which we get, get things like The Hunger Games and more, can be our starting point to talk about what is what has this got to do? with us as a society because we believe you know there's sort of cultural analysis and cultural critique that the things that you experience in culture books movies music uh video games the genres the the, the styles they take on must be saying something about us as a society right because art tends to do that art tends to be reflexive it doesn't have to be but it tends to be reflexive the same is true of zombies i don't know if we all remember like how zombies were everywhere in the 2000s uh, from, you know, every single video game had to have like a zombie mini game in it, but also there was uh, so many movies, so many movies about zombies. I'm struggling to even think of one because there are so many uh, zombie land, the resident evil series, uh, right. all the remakes of day of the dead. Right. Um, there was even like towards the end, I think when the, the, the sort of genre was, not being not not as sort of omnipresent as it was, there was even like a zombie love story, like a zombie teen romance movie, which I can't remember. I think it was called something like I can't even remember the name, but yeah. mm. and so what what does zombies have to say about our society? Well, one of the most uh, I, I think compelling analyses of why zombies were everywhere for us in culture is because the modern capitalism has a zombification effect on workers. So zombies, of course, are this countless horde of shambling, sort of brainless creatures lacking sort of prefrontal cortex and thought, and they're all just... Uh, they're all just... Driven by the base impulses like 
hunger. Right. Just shambling towards the same kind of goal. There is a really interesting sort of critique um, that I can't speak to at, at any real length, but I would just like to bring up. And that is the idea that the sort of prevalence of the zombie culture, the idea or the idea of like the zombie apocalypse was sort of a, uh, uh, a recognition of like how uh, so much of the uh, upper class in, uh, in America uh, understands that their wealth is ill-gotten in some means and that there there is some sort of like divine punishment that or, or, or some that, that they are they are due like a reckoning essentially in the form of something awful happening to them like a zombie apocalypse mm. so that's a perspective from the ruling class from the wealthy you know as if you have to you have to protect yourselves and also yeah i mean something bad catastrophic is going to happen on a, on a massive scale and, and these hordes of people are going to come from you right and and who are the hordes of people well it's it's people like you and i right who just sort of get up every morning and go to work so you can make money and you're just sort of grueling dragging yourself through the day's toils yeah and the, the zombies right we the, are zombies right we are zombies. we are the zombies we are the the 99 percent right and the days add up to weeks add up to years add up you know and it just kind of goes on and, and we, we are the zombies and, and that's one of the, so this is what we're talking about when it comes to cultural analysis of like what do zombies have to say about us well, well we are the zombies right and in so many films um oh what's that really popular uh tv series about zombies the walking dead walking dead thank you matt where you know often the films will of course not center zombies even though we are the zombies they'll center what it's like for humans to survive in a zombie world as if they will be survivors you know <laughs> and, and what it would be like to be those survivors and the rational choices we would have to make as humans and often those human survivors it's not the zombies who are the actual enemies it's the other humans who will turn against one another and and, and through deceit and through own self-interest right yeah that, one of my favorite zombie movies uh, actually deals very uh um specifically with that theme and that's uh 28 days later mm -hmm. right it also came out in the 2000s so zombies big in the 2000s has a lot to say i would i would argue about capitalism and what it means to exist in our modern economic world well let's turn our attention to battle royale what does battle royale have to say about our world and we talked a little bit about that 2000 film let's talk about battle royale in general what so the theme what is common amongst the genre well battle royale is all about being the last person standing so it's a game <laughs> doesn't sound too fun but it's always set up as a game as a, a competition a trial a competition a challenge between a bunch of people to see who can be the last person standing. And by last person standing, we don't mean the last person, you know, um, hanging out on top of a hill, king of the hill style, or capture the flag. We mean people will kill each other until there's one person left. That's the last person standing. There does also seem to be an element of the characters not having a choice in the matter. Like in, in none of these movies, at least not you know, in the Hunger Games or Divergent or any of the others that came after that or in Battle Royale in the film that we watched uh, last night, none of the characters wanted to be there. And there none of one. them... <laughs> okay. There was Most of the characters didn't want to be there and didn't actually know what they were getting into. Right. Exactly, Mary. So there's this game that it forces people to pit against one another in, in mortal combat <laughs> to see who can be the last person standing. The players are often there because there's this sort of overseer role, this sort of referee role. In this film, Battle Royale, it was the Japanese government who was like, yo, something's wrong with kids these days. <laughs> Let's uh, set them straight by making them engage in mortal combat. Because that's going to really be effective and making them sane <laughs> right <laughs> i'm not that familiar with the hunger Games series maybe one of you knows but in hunger games it was sort of society at large engaged in this sort of ritualistic annual uh, battle royale yeah i don't remember if it was 
every year or i think it may have been every five years mm. I, in in the hunger games it wasn't as often as in battle royale but the basic premise from the hunger games is that there had been there is this massive powerful central government and at some point in history there was a massive revolt among the districts um and so in order to punish the districts for the revolt against the capital they started doing the hunger games so two tributes from each district are chosen every however many years to go and fight to the death hmm. and in the case of video games there's often not even that much of a story it's sort of like hey here's the game you're thrown into this this land to fight to the death have fun so there's this overseer role often though mary whether mm -hmm. it's in the hunger games it's the powerful central government whether in the film battle royale it's the japanese government I, i'm not sure this is what this is getting at is any anti-government critique I'm, I'm not sure i'm there with that yet but it's more of like saying the participants are usually not willing they are forced into this scenario and why is that important is because if you are forced into a last person standing scenario, there's a lot of people, uh, indeed most people I would hope, based on how society inculcates values in each other, uh, most people would not be all that comfortable by all of a sudden having to turn into murderers. <laughs> and you get different reactions from these, well, contestants or participants in the game of Battle Royale who have different responses to what they're being forced into. In this 2000 film, Battle Royale, we see some participants uh, commit suicide because they're like, no, I am not gonna take anyone else's life and I'm not gonna wait around until someone takes mine. So they just, you know, uh, take matters into their own hands, so to speak. Other players choose to hide. They say, well, I, I'm not taking anyone else's life I'm just going to hopefully try to just survive and wait this thing out and, and hopefully have some resolution come. So they try to avoid combat. Others still uh, end up embracing <laughs> the challenge, whether, you know, whether sort of willingly or not, they sort of crack under the pressure or they're like, hey, maybe this ain't that bad. <laughs> and they take up the mantle of, um, you know, em embracing uh, the, the last person standing combat. And so you get different reactions, of course, from participants, uh, none of whom, for the most part, are w uh, willing in this <laughs> uh, game to play, but are forced to. And that's important because in Battle Royale, uh, often there is a there the ov the overseer, whether it's the government or some other entity, does not allow their the game to go on forever. There's always a time limit. So in this 2000 film Battle Royale, folks have three days. If there's not one person remaining at the end of three days, then everyone dies because they have necklaces on that blow up. <laughs> you know, and, and I don't know what happened in the Hunger Games. I don't know if there is a time limit in the Hunger Games, actually. But I think in the Hunger Games, there is a lot more control right. over the... Well, there's much more media influence and everyone, people are watching everything that's going on. So if they realize that there are a lot of people after a certain amount of time, then they'll just make the ecosystem harder because they have control over the ecosystem, which is different than this uh, this movie. Right. So in the Hunger Games, the, the overseer society, they can like cause storms to happen. Mm -hmm. They can do weapon drops. They can unleash insects or disease and, and, and force the whittling down of the players and increasing the tension. In video games, there's often an environmental threat. In Fortnite, I believe there's a storm that is slowly coming closer. And uh, it encircles the island that the game takes place on so that players are constantly being forced into a smaller and smaller area. And the idea is that obviously they'll come into contact with each other. Right. And have to fight each other because mm -hmm. of that. Right. So you can't just run and hide because the environment is forcing you to become closer and closer to other people. And what would you fight with? Well, in some battle royale, like this 2000 film, you start off with a random weapon. <laughs> Whether it's a firearm, pot lid, best weapon, or a pot lid, <laughs> or a pair of binoculars. Yes, you, you probably want to hope you start with the firearm. I guess if you're going for the survival strategy, 
um, if you if you want to cook, maybe the pot lid's all right. But you know, um, in the Hunger Games, there you don't start with anything. You sort of spawn in this uh, in the arena, and you either choose to run to a central location where all this all these weapons are, but obviously that's more dangerous because other people are centralized in that spot too. Or you kind of can choose to run away and try to survive on your own without any weapons. In video games, it's often uh, sort of a similar Hunger Games style where you often start off with nothing at all. Everyone is on the same level, nothing at all. You drop into the world and you have to scavenge for weapons and hope you find good ones before other people find good ones and you can take them out with an advantage of the weapons that you have found. That's an element that's found both in the 2000 movie and the Hunger Games. The idea that these um, players are sort of dropped into an arena and the the uh, the sort of uh, chance that they are able to acquire a useful weapon is is entirely random. Right. So hopefully we've established on evidence of design on 100.9 FM WXIR what the battle royale genre is a last man standing or last person standing style game where there's unwitting participants who are forced to compete to be the last person standing uh, because of some sort of overseer role they have a time limit to become the last person standing and there are also often environmental threats and weapons that they can scavenge for scattered throughout their arena. What then does that have to say about society? Wow, that sounds perhaps pretty far-fetched, like not sure what that has anything to do with. Well, let's get into that now. Let's talk about who, let, let's, let's start out with, say, who are the actors in these scenarios? So in the film Battle Royale, the 2000 Japanese film, the overseers are the Japanese government, and the participants are ninth graders. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and, and, and so what, why that fighting is going on in the film is because, Matt, you alluded to earlier that, you know, set in this sort of fictional, proto-fictional world, the Japanese society is facing malaise, there's economic slowdowns, culture is kind of falling apart, and there's the sense of weakening. And youth are sort of behind the sense of weakening. They're becoming rebellious. They're not taking education seriously. They're not respecting authority. And indeed, that is why we find out all this is happening. The youth are forced to fight because they don't trust adults. <laughs> and they don't follow... I'll learn them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't follow uh, the rules. And so actually in the film, their former teacher ends up forcing them to fight to the death. So if you're a teacher out there... Um, and you gotta, you know, I don't know, maybe this is some like uh, cathartic, <laughs> well, actually, no, we, we're not going to get into sort of the educational critique, of, you know, Japanese educational critique of this film, but it's actually really interesting about like what's going on in Japanese society at the time to lend them to create a film like this, where teachers are forcing their students to fight to the death. It's not so much like, oh, teachers are victimized. It's that the students themselves are victimized in this larger system that promotes competition, fierce competition among students for national ends as opposed to student ends. And so it's actually a, a critique on a critique, which is which is pretty interesting. Long story short, what I'm trying to get to here is that the, the, the participants and the overseers in the Battle Royale film, there's generational differences. And so that is the conflict, is that this new generation poses a threat to an older generation, and the older generation tries to teach a lesson to the newer generation. By making them murder each other. Right. I, I'm not sure I found many connections to our American, you know, 2021 society with these generational differences and the battle royale theme, but maybe you folks have a different answer. I, I sort of find more compelling uh, connections with um, class and struggle with battle royale. And that's fine because remember, cul uh, cultural analysis has to deal with different cultures. And in Japanese society, my understanding of it is that it's much more based on the family and generation and honor than American society is. So generational differences in 2000s Japan had a lot more to say than perhaps generational differences in 2021 America, right? So that brings us to the Hunger Games, whereas the difference between the participants and the overseers is one of class. 
I believe in my limited understanding of the Hunger Games is that the the sort of overseer in that role, the government, is the, the wealthy. The wealthy are sort of controlling the game. They are on top of society, and they're doing this as sort of um, this ritual, this calling to put the lower classes, these, what did you call them, Mary, these districts? Districts. These districts in place. And therefore, it's a sort of a class battle. Yeah, and I think what's interesting about the Hunger Games, too, is the different ways that each district reacts to it. Because it's not like the capital is wealthy and then all of the districts are poor. Um, There are actually... So there's like a capital. And if you're looking at the map, it's sort of... You know, if, if we compare it to the United States, it's like the capital is sort of in on the west coast and then as you get farther east um they get more rural and more more impoverished impoverished. so in uh in this situation there are some districts that actually are wealthy and prepare students or youth to compete in the hunger games so there's like this element of training and there is sort of an element of honor and wanting to do it whereas when you get farther out to the districts they're just trying to survive most of the time and they don't have time to think about what's going to happen if one of their kids gets to the hunger games so they kind of just are like all right well i guess this is going to happen every few years that we're just going to like lose a kid (laughs) i think interestingly um in the hunger games and it's been a while i've only read the first book and seen the last movie so i am uh, an expert (laughs) and um (laughs) I believe in the Hunger Games, the whole the whole idea of how the actual games came about was as a direct result of like a civil war or an uprising that occurred. Yeah, it that, was a, that failed. A, revol- a revolt against the capital, which failed, and this is the the capital's punishment. So, both in the Hunger Games and in Battle Royale, the two thousand film, there is this idea of some some kind of collapse that has allowed or pushed society. Mm-hmm to enacting this, you know, to our uh, sensibilities, horrific scenario. I think to theirs it's pretty horrific, too, (laughs) at least to some parts of it. But you mentioned, Mary, that in the Hunger Games world, at least, with this battle royale game going on, the wealthy districts might prepare Mm -hmm. their own populace for the games. And, and, And how might they prepare them? What does that look like? Well, like having training, I think probably... so. The way that tributes are chosen is that they get basically drawn out of a pot, but people can volunteer and override that choice. And that does happen, actually, in The Hunger Games. So spoiler if you haven't read it. But one of the characters, uh, her younger sister's name is drawn out of the pot, and she's like, no way, I'm going to go. And she volunteers. And for... For her district, which is one of the most impoverished districts of all of them, that's really rare. People don't normally volunteer because no one wants to go. Mm -hmm. Um, However, in these more wealthy districts, there are people who train for years in order. So they might uh, have weapons training and endurance training and, you know, practice surviving in different sorts of ecosystems because it's always a different sort of ecosystem that they get placed in and you never know what it's going to be. And so at that point, someone might get drawn out of the pot. I don't even know if they get to that point um, because there will be a trained tribute who volunteers because then when they come back, they're really honored and they're very, they become very wealthy. So if you win the hunger games, you get like money and fame and, and it is an honor in these more wealthy districts to win. So that brings me to one of the reasons why I think Battle Royale, the genre, the, the, the culture is resonating so much with us these days is because we live in a very competitive cutthroat world, not by accident. It's made that way by our own culture. Whether you talk about education and you're competing for the highest grades possible so you can get into the most prestigious and best schools or whether you're competing against other people, not just nationally anymore, but globally for the jobs that you want. You are in a cutthroat competitive environment all the time. I remember going to school, you know, when I was in high school, just a little more than a decade ago, and my teachers would warn us and sort of uh, admonish us, if that's the right word for this, to say that you must try hard because it's a competitive world out there and you're no longer just competing against people in your same class. 
you're no longer competing against people in the same state. You're competing against everyone else in this in the whole world in this global environment for a limited amount of jobs. Golly, you're telling that to a 16, 17, 18 year old. I was I was certainly looking forward to adulthood. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Where it's like, wow, okay, so I you know I, I got to try hard then. I, it was this sense of pressure, this anxiety that I needed to always try and, and do well because if I don't, then I'm going to fall behind and other people will take over. Uh, you know, opportunity. And I don't want to lose opportunity. And, and for me to get opportunity, I have to beat other people. So that is one of the cultural touchstones, I think, of Battle Royale, the sense of competition and anxiety all the time. Yeah, and I wonder if you can make, I, I haven't, I've just started thinking about this this very hour, but I wonder <laughs> if you can make uh, like a link between the idea of the Battle Royale and free market capitalism in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, the games are presented as being fair. Everybody's thrown into this arena with nothing, and their survival depends upon the decisions they decide to make and their natural strengths uh, uh, as a result of whatever background and, and sort of like just whatever they've been blessed with, genetically speaking. Um, but of course, this entire, this entire sort of game is being controlled by an outside party that is ensuring that it comes to a conclusion that they want. Right. That being one person left standing. And of course the same can be said of free market capitalism in which it's always presented as this thing in which the market just decides everything. Uh, everybody has an opportunity to participate. Everybody is given the same sort of, um, you know, proponents of it will say this. They'll say that everybody has a chance. But the reality is that it's structured in such a way that Really, the only people who can benefit from it are the people who are already in power. Sure. And if we're talking about the educational system, like we, Jason, you drew some uh, parallels between the educational system and how that may have influenced Battle Royale in the Hunger Games, it's, you know, makes me think of prep schools Mm -hmm. for an, as an example, like, you know, kids who are coming from wealthy families and then are able to get into really good prep schools where they're basically taking college courses in high school and then get into Harvard and then get into um, really lucrative jobs right out of college. You know, there is that same narrative of like, well, everyone has the same chance. Everyone in this country gets an education. Everyone is able to apply to the same universities. But in reality, you know, like 40% of, or, or a, a massive percentage of people who go to Harvard come out of these really prestigious prep schools. And the only people who can go there, other than a few people on scholarships, are people who can afford it. Right. And that is a, that's a, you know, absolutely, Mary, the connections between education and the Hunger Games and the class differences in the Hunger Games manifests uh, directly with our society. And that you mentioned that there are wealthy districts who, who grow up training everyone to compete how to survive in harsh mm-hmm. environments and to, to kill others. They learn how to kill others. And in, in modern society, you hear all the time of, you know, wealthy families who are buying, uh, you know, tutors for their kids, really, really uh, culturally expounding on them to study and learn hard and succeed and go to the, the best colleges. Um, I, I forgot the name of this actress from, I think it was Full House, but I think last year the scandal broke. With this. Lori Laughlin. Lori Laughlin, yeah. She, she and her husband uh, were sort of in this, I don't know, this bribe scheme or whatnot. To We, we covered on the show very briefly to essentially pay off colleges uh, to get her kids into the best places possible. Not just her kids, but other, you know, they were part of this sort of um, cabal where this trainer would work with wealthy families, take exorbitant fees from them, and then use it to like bribe the the best college entrance people to get wealthy kids in there, even if they didn't deserve to be there, right? Yeah, what, I mean, that's only the half of it. That's only when they're already at the point of getting into college. Mm-hmm. And what I read uh, an article in The Atlantic fairly recently within the past few months that was about private schools and the kind of things that they're offering to wealthy families that can afford to go there. And this preparation in order to get into a good school starts way, way, way earlier. Mm. And I think that's one of the points of the Hunger Games. It's like, 
the difference doesn't come at the point at which they're standing in the the arena or even when they're chosen. It comes when they are born into the district and into the family that they are born into that can prepare them or not to be part of this game. Exactly. So if if the first cultural touchstone we want to talk about is how Battle Royale is resonant with our culture because of this omnipresence uh, threat or notion of conflict, anxiety, and competition. The second one I would say, Mary, is this uh, this false illusion of equality in that you think in a battle royale game, the, as you said, the moment you enter into the arena and to engage in mortal combat with all of your um, your other ninth grade friends, <laughs> former ninth grade friends, I guess, mm, yeah. um, you know, you think everyone's on the same footing, but that's not true. And and many battle royale you know, cultural touchstones will we'll also subvert that as well. You know, they acknowledge that it's not true. You see that in the Hunger Games with the wealthy folks. But even interestingly, Matt, you brought this up earlier with the, the notion of the overseer in the Hunger Games or others. So, it, uh, you know, it's not just people are engaged in, in, in Mortal Kombat and may the best person win, Darwinian style, but the overseers, the architects of the game have a role to play too. In the Hunger Games, that is very obvious. Essentially, the fighters themselves are competing for wealthy suitors. And the, the wealthier and more powerful the suitor they get, the more help they can get in the battle. So the wealthy suitor can, uh, you know, give them a weapons drop, can send them... Uh, send them aid and medicine mm-hmm. can can you know help alert them to something happening so they're directly competing for help for for the wealthiest most powerful mentors possible or philanthropists as we might call them <laughs> indeed and and we see that in society too where you you know you always want the the biggest uh, you know best network and social capital on your side even though we'd like to think that it's all equal in society you enter into the arena you all compete against one another in this global free market system no 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 does not work that way. As a reminder, you're tuned in to Evidence of Design. We're talking about what Battle Royale, the genre, has to say about our society on 100.9 FM WXIR in Rochester. You can share your thoughts with us at 585-219-8889. We're also live streaming on our Facebook page, Radio EOD. Another piece I want to get to in talking about Battle Royale is this idea of whether or not someone wins if they deserve to win. So I'm going to speak about this one from the video game lens where in in video game battle royales, I don't know the exact numbers, but you know, nowadays battle royale games, you can have a hundred people competing. So if you're playing the video game, you log on, you sign in, you're ready to play, you join a match and you are one person out of say a hundred who's dropped into this arena to engage in mortal combat to be the last person standing. Uh, as someone who's around youth all the time, I'll hear youth talk about, you know, bragging about how many wins they have in, say, Fortnite or Call of Duty Warzone. And that means how many times they were the last person standing. Now, to be the last person standing in a battle royale, that can come about in multiple ways, right? You can be a, well, I guess, homicidal maniac and um, end up, well, killing other people before they kill you. Or to be the last person standing in a battle royale game, you can end up having the benefits from your benefactor if that exists in a game, right? Someone who's able to control the strings for you and you survive on top. Or to be the last person standing in battle royale, you could just be lucky. You know, a combination of them all. And what I mean by that is if there's a hundred people in a game and you're, you're set out to be the last person standing, you could take, you know, you don't have to take anyone else's life. You could end, you know, you could take one person's life, but you don't have to take anyone's, and you could still end up being the last person standing because of the environmental concerns out there, right? That could take people's, uh, take people out of the game, or because they could take each other out. And so, often, what happens in battle royale games is that the, the person, the team that ends up winning, is the team that ends up just being lucky enough to have everyone take each other out before they get them. And so, if you are a winner in battle royale, one out of a hundred, say. It doesn't mean you took out 99 other people. It could mean you took out one other person, two other person, and they, those could be the only two other people you ever see. And so it sounds like you've engaged in this, you know, really rigorous Mortal Kombat style last person standing combat, but actually you've, you've only ever saw two other people and you still walked out on top. 
And so the same notion is true, I think, in modern capitalism, where we get people, I, I engage with people all the time who say, well, J you know, Jeff Bezos is so wealthy and Amazon is so successful because he's the smartest guy out there. There's no way he could have built Amazon if he wasn't the smartest, best competitor out there. He deserves that money. It's true. I mean, if he has that much money, he deserves it because he earned it, right? <laughs> you don't get money besides earning it. Um, that's what people say. I, I, don't, I believe that's all tosh. But people will say, you know, Jeff Bezos deserves this because he engaged in a free market competition against other booksellers as Amazon started or whatever and, and rose to the top. Now, I'm not blaming Jeff Bezos or Amazon for being a successful company. Oh, you can, though. Well, I'm blaming the culture that thinks it's successful because it won in this battle royale style free market ideas, right? Oftentimes you win battle royale by being lucky. Oftentimes you win battle royale because everyone else did the work for you of taking each other out and you just rode the wave to the top. And so that's another cultural piece I want to touch on with battle royale is that you don't necessarily need to win by being the fastest, the strongest, the smartest, the whateverest. You can oftentimes win by just being lucky. Certainly having those other characteristics helps. And we've talked, Mary, about the importance of sort of being trained and groomed for these types of things mm -hmm. and the role that benefactors can have and overseers can have on your performance. But oftentimes it's, it's just being lucky. And there's this illusion that if it's one out of 100, you were better than those other 99. No, to win Battle Royale, you just need to be better than whoever you come in contact with, which could be two people, could be one person, could be five, 10, 20. You know, it, it, you just need to be better than whoever you see. That's like the old... You know, if you're getting chased by a bear, you don't need to be faster mm -hmm. than the bear. You just need to be faster than the person you're running next to. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant connection. That is always a really depressing um, <laughs> uh, statement. Yes. <laughs> just be faster than whoever you're running next to if, if a predator is chasing you. <laughs> exactly. But that that's what it is. You know, that's what Battle Royale also has to say about our society is just uh, oftentimes you can make it up by just being the luckiest, you know. And you'll, you'll compete against people in Battle Royale games who, who do what's called camping uh, in a game that just means you sit in one spot and stare at a door. So it sets you up for very advantageous position because you will have the drop on someone else, right? If you're just staring at a door and there's one entrance to the room through the door, then you'll see them before they see you. And people will oftentimes win Battle Royale by just sitting there staring at the door. And it's like, that's not a really fun way to play, but... It works sometimes. And so uh, the, the environment can, can change that up, right? If the environment forces you to move, then you can't camp there forever. But, but that's one of the things that is important to take note of. So that's the third cultural connection I want to make is that Battle Royale, whoever wins Battle Royale is oftentimes as much about luck than it is about being the fiercest, toughest person on the battlefield, although that's what you would might be led to believe who wins Battle Royale in this sort of so-called free market system. I want to touch upon now too also the idea in Battle Royale that you're never there's never a, there's never another way out. In Battle Royale uh, culture there's always groups of characters who try to say, "Wait, we don't have to engage in the overseer's machinations here. We don't have to engage in mortal combat. Why are we playing by their rules? Let's all band together and agree not to take one another's lives." And we'll figure a way out of this. We'll figure a way to overthrow the Overseer, right? That's in every Battle Royale, at least movie that I've seen. Uh, it's not really in video games because <laughs> video games are just about the combat, right? For the most part. Um, this is really interesting one because the movies often lead you to believe that there is no other way out besides engaging in the Mortal Kombat. Indeed, they always prefaced is showing examples of people dying because they try to take an alternative way out. The people at the beginning who are often the first to go are those who often are shown to go against the rules by saying, no, I'm not going to engage in this mortal combat, or no, let's all band together. And they're either taken out by the overseer themselves directly to say, nope, if you try to do that, this is what happens to you. They're set as an example. They're called from the population to begin with. Or they're shown taken out by the more aggressive homicidal players who are there just to take lives. And that's meant to say, this is a, a survival of the fittest world. And if you try to you know, be nice, you're going to be the first step down. So movies will often go their way to show how there's, you know, if you try to do another way out in Battle Royale, it ain't going to work. 
But in this film that we watched, Battle Royale 2000, and also I believe in The Hunger Games, although I'm not super sure, the protagonist is often able to win without being the homicidal maniac, right? The homicidal maniac in these films never wins. And that is a cultural decision by the directors to say, no, we, you know, we don't want these people to be extolled by society. We don't want to make the point that if you're the best trained, the best shot, the most ra rabid, <laughs> that you'll come out on top. So often the protagonist is neither, is not someone who is a homicidal maniac, um, but is also not someone who is totally unwilling to fight. Mm -hmm. They straddle a liminal state between and end up um, sometimes surviving with someone else, sometimes surviving by themselves, but not without lack of trying to survive with others. Yeah, that seems about... Uh, that is, that is on par for the Hunger Games, I think, too, where the the main character who does end up surviving is not from one of these wealthy districts who was trained, but she's also had to hunt her whole life in order to eat. So she's not totally unwilling. You know, she doesn't want to go out and murder anyone, but she she does kill out of necessity when she is forced into that situation. Right. And I find this part of, of the battle royale genre so interesting because it's such a it's such a liminal space where sometimes it goes in I, I think a positive direction, sometimes it goes in sort of a, a more negative direction. It's I I think it's kind of fun to imagine yourself in one of these situations. That's the point of them. That's the point of culture. You know, these cultural exposés to imagine yourself engaging in them. And so, if I were in a battle royale world, what would I do? And I would like to think that I would channel my energies in going after the overseer. The, the architects of the game itself. You see that attempted in all, oftentimes, you know, battle royale genres, but rarely do they ever fully succeed. Oftentimes, the people who try to go after the architects will end up coming close or the, the seeming virtuous, but will always lose out in the end towards the more homicidal tendencies of other players. Or, or, or just like the the sort of pressure that uh, people might feel to conform to the game mm -hmm. and i find that really interesting because what if everyone sort of banded together and didn't engage in the mortal combat then these arenas would lose their meaning right the, the reason why they exist is to give the audience a bread and circus style gladiator arena type of um you know, last person standing entertainment, if everyone mutually agreed not to engage in that behavior, it would lose its cultural significance and therefore the games themselves would become impotent. Maybe the first group would end up, the overseer would end up setting the example with that group and, and calling them all and letting the time limit expire, the environmental concerns reach up to them. But, you know, example after example would eventually cause the games to become impotent. It, this really relates to the, the battle, battle royale of the movie um, in that all of the participants in in the competition are classmates who know each other and while some of them may share you know differences and and sort of petty grievances with one another the being driven to kill one another is this pressure that's being exerted on them by uh, an outside force that is their real enemy and it sort of reminds me if i can make another <laughs> uh connection to our, to our world in the idea of how so often, um, you know, in, in America, the sort of right-wing conservative base uh, of, uh, of voters is often um, sort of scaremongered into believing that, you know, the, the people who are, who are responsible for their sort of poor living conditions or, or the people that are going to take away, you know, whatever sort of uh, life that they've made for themselves are immigrants, are, you know, poor people that who are trying to game the system, trying to live off of welfare and not work. Whereas in reality, of course, the the actual political enemies of really just about everybody living in this country are the wealthiest. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Matt. And that's where I was going with that point, is that Battle Royale is a, is a libertarian, ultra-conservative fantasy world where you just survive off of your own bootstraps, it's a free market competition. The best person is standing, and it's a zero-sum game. 
you're out there on your own use your own ingenuity and and skills to best others it's a free market libertarian ultra conservative fantasy land but hopefully we've been deconstructing that notion throughout the show and you're saying too matt completely agree that when one person commits an act of violence they justify the violence itself you know, even if even if their act of violence is against if their act of violence is against the perceived threat of violence, they have justified that perceived threat by doing the violence themselves. So violence always creates more violence. It goes back to Thich Nhat Hanh, Gandhi, etc., Martin Luther King Jr. Violence creates more violence. And I'm not saying in a perfect world, oh, we don't need violence, we don't need police, we don't need armies. You know, I, yes, I love that. But what I'm what I'm trying to say is that this perceived threat of violence ends up making it real. And so the, the Fox News effect of constantly showing, um, you know, racist depictions, uh, you know, brown skinned people uh, at the border, right? Totally racist, totally ridiculous, migrant caravans, all that stuff, constantly har harping day after day, second after se second propaganda into the American psyche that we are in a dog eat dog world out there. And the, the <laughs> what are they, Judeo Christian values <laughs> or whatever are under threat right that creates the violence that is the violence indeed and it ends up justifying itself by creating more violence right it proves its own point and so that is the issue with the battle royale games is that they don't need to exist to begin with if people take away that perceived threat of violence if that perceived threat of violence goes away the threat goes away so take away the perception you take away the actual threat and there's an interesting narrative, like meta narrative later layer there of um, the perception and actual threat. You know, the environment. <laughs> so it goes to what you're saying that, you know, in our country, in, in the United States of America, we believe on evidence of design that the actual threat in our society, you know, is not migrant caravans or, or not um, cancel culture or God, what is that education thing that we just talked about? Um, Critical race theory. Critical race theory, thank you. Yeah, I mean, th those aren't the threats to society. The threats are the fact that the vast majority of Americans lack the material means to meet their own subsistence, right? The fact that a small group of people have made a system that gives them all the political, economic, and social power. And it seemed like in the Battle Royale that we just watched, one of the main issues was that there was massive unemployment that stopped the youth from respecting adults. Right. Because they didn't have the means to meet their own needs right exactly it's the the economic conditions that end up setting up <laughs> the the collapse in society and so uh, in in this in these battle royale genres you know the people should be going after the, the the systemic the architects of the system the overseers and not necessarily against each other it's the homicidal maniacs who end up making the game what it is the need for the last person standing it's the homicidal maniacs who end up doing that the homicidal maniacs who believe in the perceived threat or you know let's be honest some people like violence and want you know some people are just tuned to committing acts of violence and you know a very small minority but it's those people who end up sort of the toxic spillover effect on the rest of the game and so the the, the cultural connection here for the battle royale is that if we went after the actual underlying conditions and not set up these sort of gladiator style releases in um pathos then the underlying conditions for everyone would be improved but there's always a bait and switch there so we have to wrap up our discussion now of battle royale on evidence of design on 100.9 fm wxar in rochester there was another huge point i was going to make and it's just escaped my brain and i'm going to kick myself afterwards but oh well thanks so much for tuning in to our critique of battle royale genre you can watch the 2000 film battle royale you can hire it out from the library if Matt doesn't have all the copies uh, to himself. Who knows? No. <laughs> but it's out there. It's good stuff. Thanks so much for tuning in, folks. You can find all of our past episodes wherever you find your podcasts. Search for Evidence of Design. We're also on YouTube by searching for the Evidence of Design YouTube channel. Big thanks to Evidence or big thanks to WXIR on 100.9 FM for allowing such conversations to happen and hey it's a long weekend out there so if you're celebrating fourth of july or whatever else have a good time and take care i was your host jason taylor joined in wxar studios by my good friends and co-hosts 
Matt Treadwell. Chica says best girl. And Mary Lawrence. <laughs> Have a great day. Until next time, folks. Be well. Be safe. Don't engage in Mortal Kombat-style games. Take care, and bye-bye.